Hi everybody. Uh, I just thought I'd do a quick video on uh, starting my day. There's a few interesting things I thought I'd share. One is I sort of said quickly in another video that uh, working with clay that was a little too hard last year, I pulled this right wrist, which is something I keep telling people they should, you know, it's very easy not to do. And I got really stupid with a, a 50 pound bell jar that the, the red clay was too hard. But that's going to be the discussion today is about how to get clay that's hard, uh, not so hard. Now, I know I should have this camera put at my head, but I'm talking about my wrist at the moment. So what I want to just say is, is you can go to uh, something like CVS and buy this material that stretches. And what I'm, what I do every day is I take a little bit of just because this is the cheapest way of doing this. I'll just take a little bit of masking tape and I stretch out the end of this so that it doesn't come on un, unstretched when I do it. And I just add a little tip on both sides of that. So again, I stretch it and add that. Okay, so just for starting, I'll put it on the top of my wrist and then give it a good pull to get this. It just gives me support in a way on my right wrist that means uh, this particular spot is not working as hard because the thing I'm putting it to is, you know, pretty tough. Okay, so starting on the top again, I'll just take a bit of because masking tape is an inexpensive material, there are lots of other sort of more expensive things you can do that will do this. But this is a very cheap way to do this particular bandage. So when I get right to the end, I'll just break it off in a way that I have the last bond in a place that isn't going to be roughed up by the clay. So now that wrist is ready for some heavier work. So what I want to talk about today, what I want to, <laughs> hello. So uh, the thing I want to show you guys is that I'm working in red clay. Uh, I'm trying to look at this screen so I know how far away this camera is supposed to be. At any rate, um, where do I start? I think I should start by saying about two thirds of my pots are made in, in white clay. So for the white clay, again, I have to turn this so it's going the other way so I can look from behind now. So the white clay is sitting down here. Uh, I get half a ton at a time, which, you know, goes for a few days. Um, if I'm being leisurely, it's about uh, 250, 300 pounds a day. As an old guy, I'm, you know, slowed down a little bit. It used to be a good potter should be able to throw really that amount of clay in a day, half a ton, um, for doing flower pots because they do take a lot of clay. But anyway, I do have a company, uh, Sheffield Pottery Supplies, uh, make up a nice body that I use for, for making the white pots. And then... I put it through that machine over there, which I don't know if there's enough light to show the pug mill. But so the really simple thing is, is if, if you have clay that's too hard or too soft from a box, you can put it into a clay mixer. Bluebird made as a system a, a clay mixer in this pug mill. So, but if you don't have a shop going, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is, I have two thirds of my sales are with white clay. So I keep the pug mill going in white clay. If I want to get a specialized body, which is what this red clay is from the nice people at Sheffield, I think, I can't remember whether it was four tons, two tons, 4,000 pounds. I can't remember, but it was, you know, a particular quantity. So, uh, the way it's worked this year is we've had so much white wear 
that I've been slow to buy this from them. And they're very, very kind. They made up a, a batch of clay for me, and then uh, they only charge me as I buy it. Well, some of these boxes of clay that I, that I got here say February 2019. Now, this clay was perfect for throwing in 2019, but today it's kind of hard as a rock. Now, there are lots of cool ways of fixing that. If you have a business like mine, you have a, a pug mill. Uh, you also have a clay mixer. So I could put this clay back into a clay mixer and then finish it up going through the, the pug mill. Now, as I just said, I don't want to change that machine over there for red, red clay right now because I'm not doing that much of it. So what do you do when you have really, really hard clay? Uh, and uh, everybody that, that's uh, doing this knows where this is going, but there are uh, some students that th this might be interesting to see. And it's really easy to uh, reclaim clay that's gotten too hard. So I'm going to set up the camera a little differently and I'll keep going. So I have these really simple buckets here and each one has a slug of clay in it cut in half. So what are they? They're 24 pounds. So they're 12 pounds uh, put into the water. These were put in to soak uh, yesterday afternoon. And what I'm going to do now is set up the camera as I've sort of practiced at my table, pointing at the table. So let's see. Now I'm going to turn this thing around so I can see it. Yeah. All right. So the trick is to try to keep the table as dry as possible while you're going forward on this. I'm, I am just making sure there's no dry bits on there. And I have my two wonderful, uh, I, are these spackling sponges? There's something you get at Home Depot, but boy, are these useful. Uh, so I'm just gonna go over and get the first 50 pounds of this. I'm getting as much water off of it as I can into the bucket. And then I'm just starting by putting it on a, one of the sponges and drying it off as much as possible. So the next size pot I'm making are 12s. So what I'm doing is I'm just gonna clean off a few of these. And for the sake of this video, I think I'll just put these aside and put them for uh, for sitting. But I do want you to see how how good this clay is. So this is 12 pounds. I'm just going to cut it in half and see how close to 12. Uh, I'm into six that this is. See that nice bounce? I don't want it to go up, but I just want it to be, that's really pretty close. So this is a really nice consistency for throwing now. So being that I have this set up for wedging six because of my wrist, I'm just, that's too much. See that nice little bounce? That's what I want it to do is just bounce a little bit.
so there's 12 pounds. So this is from 12, I might put two of these together to make a 24 or, you know, a 24 or a 12 more is, I make pots in uh, 12s, 24s, 36s, uh, and then from 36 I go up to uh, 50 and 60. But anyway, I'll make a batch of these and put them aside. But for now, today's the day I do the bills. So on the whole, right now all I'm going to be doing is getting this clay out of the water. And I don't think you need to see a lot of those happen, but I'll do uh, enough that at least you get the idea how... Now, look what I did. So I got to use this one. You want to stay away from things getting wet. That's the, because if the surface gets very wet, then it gets sticky. So the more uh, careful you are about this, uh, the better it is for wedging. But so right now I'm just kind of, so that's back to being, uh, you know, a regular uh, slug of clay. I love all the different, the English terms for, you know, one, one uh, piece of clay coming out of the pug mill. I kind of can't remember that word. I don't think it's a slug, but it's like that. Anyway, so this this being uh, basically 25 pounds is half a half a cast. A cast is 50 pounds. So uh, the old time uh, English flower pot makers always talked about you know a good thrower should be able to do 20 casts a day. In fact, they used to talk about so. A number two pot would be this amount of clay, right? Because four of these little pieces, well, two bags like this would be 50 pounds, right? So uh, this pot, you'd need two of these to make a cast. So in the same way, a 12.5 piece of clay uh, would have been called a number four and so on. Um, let's see, what else? I'll just do that one more time. Oh no, yeah, I have one more. So I'm trying to get the, the buckets empty so I can show you how to set up for the bucket. I mean, <laughs> putting a piece of clay in a bucket isn't that hard, but you notice that the clay is sort of uh, squared off a little bit to to work uh, to fit in that squared off bucket. Let's see. You're not going to believe how hard. <laughs> this clay was yesterday. You're going to see that in a minute. We're in, uh, let's see, the, the month is February. So January and February, I do my either estate work or wholesale. And the one thing to say to potters is the word profit margin actually equals wage for us who are independent workers. So wholesale isn't a, a lot of fun for me because I can sell as many pots as I can make at retail. So my profit margin being cut down by doing wholesale is sort of painful. But I do I do have one or two shops that I really like. So I I keep making, I have two shops that I make for, and uh, that's what January and February is about, is making for a cottage and garden. 
out in Newport, and Shakespeare's Garden, which is here in Connecticut in Brookfield. And there may be a person or two that I, you know, will let take a few, you know, a few hundred dollars worth of pots away. But on the whole, it's just those two. If, if uh, the Gardner Museum wants something or uh, the Cloisters, those are my two. I'll do, I'll do anything for those guys. So here's some of that sad clay. Usually I break these open down below, but for the camera I want to open it here. And uh, Oh, the date's on the side here. So this, this particular one says May of 2019. Yeah, well, I guess that's what it, the other ones were February of 19. I don't even know how to tell you how, how hard that clay is. We always take our boxes and use them with the customers as the sales bins. So that's recycled to the customer in the retail shop. But look at this. You're not going to believe this. Ready? Nothing. A little bit of a flat. but it's just so much nicer to have it sort of precise. So this is just under 16, so I go in and make sure it's in the middle and make a dot. So the clay has been shaped to go into one of these, you know, square buckets. And the plastic is carefully put aside because these are going to go back in there tomorrow. <laughs> See what I mean? All right. So I put those underneath. And take my wire. Just cut that in half. You'd really hurt yourself trying to throw this stuff. I don't even know how to show you how hard that is. So being flattened off like that, these go in uh, very happily into those buckets. So that's that idea. <laughs> if I did this with, if I hit it like that when I was uh, using Play ready for the wheel. It would have, uh, <laughs> it would have been very different. Oh, and I, I like doing that measuring with the plastic on, so I don't don't dirty this so much. I mean, I could eyeball the middle. It, it just is nice to get it. It just saves time later that these are more exact for. Especially if you're cutting to six. Uh, you know, if I'm making a 12 pounder, I'm cutting to six quite a lot. And when I'm making a nine pounder, it's a little more. Well, I better remember to get this out. I'm not going to film doing all of these, but. 
I just since I'm putting this one in that bucket, I want to get that out. So I'm just going to walk you around the room a little bit and give you the idea of how you prepare for your day. So before I start making the the wares for the day, there's a few chores that happen. Um, how are the furnaces? Uh, I have three scut kills going. I'm going to turn this around again so I can see where I am. And bring this up and go for a walk. Okay, so I got three of these little scut 10 cubic footers. Uh, outside we're, we're doing a sprung arch kill for cone 10, but for the flower pots, this is just fine. This kill says it's complete and it's at 340. So th this is a kill I'm, I'm about to draw. Again, the old term, you know, for taking pots out. And these have been checkering. So this group of pots, um, I can't remember how long I checkered yesterday with this, but I'm going to leave it for another two hours, I think. And the same over here. So I got two kills checkering. <laughs> I'm going to have to put the... So when I got some of my wife's little ones here to go around stuff. Um, so I'm going to put you guys down for a second and set those kills. So that lid's open. Okay, so we're drawing one furnace and we're checkering to set two others. Okay, we're getting the clay ready. We're, you know, taking it out and putting it in these buckets to get the clay soft enough to use kind of silly to have to do it but it's just that's where we are and here's you know more of that that's resting after being softened up now some of the throwing yesterday afternoon these are number nines this uh, this is a pot taken from the portrait of Rubens peel with geranium it's a pot that's got a, a, a Georgian rim and then this really cool you know, rope, rope under the rim. Uh, the portrait's from 1801. But at any rate, we got this fan that I just started early morning to just dry out this top rim enough for fiddling. So I guess I'll show you a little bit of that and then uh, we'll be done for the day and I can go and do my uh, bills. <laughs> just a second. Okay, so what I've just done is I've taken these pots and cut them under. And instead of showing you a hundred of these, I'm just, or, you know, well, not a hundred, eleven of them. <laughs> I'm just showing you, I'm going to show you how to do one. And so I have one left over here. And I'm just going to bring this camera over to this spot. Does that sort of show the wheel head? There we go. Okay. So, first of all, I made up this ring of clay, which means if you have a bat and it's a little warped in one way or another, if it's sitting on this surface, one way around it holds, and the other way around it just spins, so instead of having to think about finding out which way around you have it, I just made a, a donut out of clay so that I can just put these down quickly and not think about them. So this particular batch of pots I made uh, on bats. And the first thing that I've been doing with these is I take a, an apple core I think William Sonoma I got this, I don't know, but it's just a regular New England apple core. And uh, being that I was trained in Great Britain where it rains a lot, you want a lot of drainage. So I made two holes 
in the bottom of each of these, cut it under. Now, if this was a bigger putt, I'll show you how I do this if it's a bigger putt. I'll take this guy and put it on here and then just flip it over after cutting it like that, right? So now I can pull this away and right away save that play. There are plus and minuses to throwing on bats like this. This is still pretty wet, so I put these away standing up against the wall or some place. I have a spot by my window where I put them. Okay. So, in the pottery world, this is called a fettling knife. Originally, fettling was, you saw that done on uh, pieces that have been made in molds and there'd be uh, mold lines that you had to cut away. So there was a knife for sort of cleaning it up. And in the, the trade, there was the term, he's in fine fettle. Well, it, it's not, they would say, you know, the pot's in fine fettle, but it did end up turning into a term that people used out in the world for being all cleaned up. So with a fettling knife, you clean up the edge. You saw I hit this pot with that fettling knife. So I'm just closing up that little gash I made. Okay, so now for my pottery, I like taking a, I have a little wheel, and on here it says, uh, what does it say on here? It says, Wolf Pottery, G. Wolf, Bantam, Connecticut, six pounds. So this is actually nine pounds, and I don't have one for nine. So I just use the six, and then I take my stamp that says nine, this just makes life easy for people that are wholesaling because they can turn the pot over and say, oh, this is a nine pounder, I paid so much for it. And then I, I sign the pot and date it with the back of my finger. Now, this is the more important part of this video. Uh, Adam Keeling stopped by that, you know, last uh, two years ago. And I've been using regular boards uh, to put pots away and I was getting cracks. But using a slatted board has completely solved that problem. So you saw before I had the pot sitting under the fan because I wanted this top rim to get pretty hard. And now I'm just gonna put the pots aside on this slatted board. And in a little while, when this board is full, I'll just put it up above. And tomorrow, these will be ready to checker. In other words, they'll be ready to go into the furnace uh, at 200 degrees, uh, each pot upside down like this with another row of them above, making a circular checker in the little electric kill. And by the end of the day, they'll be ready for going into the furnace. Uh, so it means every day you can be getting one of those little 10 cubic foot kills uh, ready for another firing with another basic yield. So the only, only thing to keep you going is, is you gotta make sure that you make enough pots each day to fill the kill day after tomorrow if you want to fire those kills 365 days a year. I, I kind of don't ever do that, I have to say. But we do fire a lot. Six goes there. Well, nine goes there, and nine goes there. I want to use a different sponge because it has a different feel to it. Okay. Wolf 2021. Who thought you'd still be alive in 2021? Not me.
1950 was a long time ago, I gotta say. I don't remember 1950. I remember uh, 52 or 53 pretty well. But, and for around here, we all remember 55 because we had a big, uh, huge flood. The Naugatuck River was, what a mess that was. And the same with the Housatonic. We had a bridge nearby where I grew up that ended up uh, being pulled down by, well, there was a smaller bridge and some logs got stuck behind it. And it, there was, the bridge was, I don't know, two and a half stories up in the air that they got torn away by the, the water. Anyway. So there's another one. I guess that's enough of this. What do you think? I mean, I have to do the 11 of them, but you don't need to see that. So I'm going to turn this off again. I may turn it back on and show you, uh, you know, how I unload a kill and how I stack for the next day. Okay, talk to you soon.